You are watching With a Cup of Tea, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings. Now, here's our show. Well, we have with us today uh, uh, Ken Robinson, uh, uh, retired Navy captain and currently a historian of uh, Montana history. Um, and you have a new book, Cold War Montana. Uh, before we get into that, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, just briefly about your background. Sure, Mark. Good to be with you. And it's always good to bring out a new book. It's always exciting. I, uh, I grew up on a, on a homestead, I guess you'd say. My, my grandfather and father had both been farmers, and I broke the lifelong, multi-generational farming tradition in the Robison family because after my one-room country school for elementary school, I went through Great Falls High School and on to the University of Montana and directly into the United States Navy after that. And this, this was uh, kind of an exciting period. Uh, I went in in 1960, so Cold War was well underway. And uh, for the next almost 30 years, I was uh, traveling around the world uh, a lot of time at sea and a lot of time with uh, overseas assignments and uh, the Cold War was always in the forefront. And you know, I, uh, the, the one thing I've emphasized in, in my writing and in selecting topics is neglected history, ne neglected Montana history. And uh, that led me to do a lot with African American history and, and women's history and so on. But uh, parts of our military history beyond Custer and, and maybe the Nez Perce and the, the uh, uh, Marias or Baker Massacre, a few, few things have been not only studied but probably way overstudied. But you get to, you know, the, the Civil War and the impact it had on Montanans or you get to World War I uh, and I found, uh, you know, virtually nothing had been written. So that led me to three books on, on the uh, Montanans that had come either during or after the Civil War. And then two books with, uh, on the centennial of World War I. I looked at what was missing from the Cold War and I found uh, nothing had been published in Montana. A couple of, of pretty good articles on in publications like Montana Magazine and Western History, uh, but th there sure was no book on Montanans in World War One. I. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, Montanans in the Cold War. So that got me on a, uh, a quest to fill that gap. And well, I, I, re I remember that period of time very well, growing up in Montana and feeling like I was right in the middle of a big nuclear bullseye. Yeah, it really was, and you know whether whether it's World War II that got us started on our way into the post-war period and the missile period, it was that huge role that Montana played, uh, partly by uh, Great Falls with the two air bases, the new one called Great Falls Air Base that became Malmstrom in the 1950s, and Gore Field, the commercial airport. Those two bases did the land lease program, they did bomber B-17 training and so on during World War II. And, and because of the huge impact that they had, as well as Cutbank, Lewistown, and Glasgow, which were also major bases for the bomber training in World War II, that led the defense establishment to decide that Great Falls Air Base should become permanent in, after the end of World War II. The other bases in Montana were shut down, although Glasgow's was later uh, brought back to active status with uh, B-52s later on. But so it it began really with all the things that were happening in World War II. Uh, the Soviets had a, I mean, the the base in Great Falls was literally a Soviet air base. Over around 8,000 aircraft went from Great Falls, Montana. Most of those had come directly from production plants, aircraft produ production plants in Buffalo and California and so on. 
And they had been flown to Great Falls, Montana, mostly by women pilots. It was a brand new concept, the, the WASP program. And, and, and then, so they'd come to Great Falls, Montana, they'd have, they'd be winterized and they'd have the, the uh, decorations on them changed. There'd be a big red star for the Soviet Air Force. And then uh, American pilots uh, would would fly them to Alaska, and Soviet pilots would take them over there. So, Ladd Air Base at, at, in Alaska and Great Falls Air Base were literally Soviet air bases during war. Now, this is what you you uh, you mentioned the Lend Lease program. Is that what this is uh, about? Well, it starts with that because uh, I really have a subtitle called from stolen secrets to the ace in the hole. Well, the stolen yeah. secrets came about in that World War II Lend-Lease program because the aircraft didn't leave Great Falls, Montana empty. They were loaded with uh, hundreds and thousands and even millions of tons of legitimate supplies for the Soviet Union. Roosevelt was desperate to keep the Soviet Union fighting on the Eastern Front until we could build up our army and get a Western Front invasion and 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 so on. So he was ready to to give a lot, and part of what he gave was uh, Soviet spying, which was very active. Uh, illegals coming in uh, through the air base, spreading out around the country, no accounting, and things like. Uh, uh, the, the industrial secrets as well as military secrets and even things related to the uh, development of an atom bomb all were, are known to have gone out uh, through that huge pipeline. So, But that's just the beginning in my mind of the Cold War because mm -hmm. then you get to things like Churchill's great speech saying the Iron Curtain is descending on Eastern and Central Europe, and it was. The Soviets had occupied those countries as they'd ruled the German army back. And also um, the Berlin blockade of 1948, uh, when the Soviets thought, aha, we'll cut off any access to East, uh, to West Berlin. Of course, the Allies occupied West Berlin the Soviets occupied East Berlin, and there was a th pretty substantial chunk of Germany that the that the uh, Soviet Union had on the on the west side. So they had Berlin surrounded. They cut off uh, canal, uh, rail, and road traffic to Berlin, and that's the first deciding point. Truman decided that you had to had to resupply Berlin by the air, and that's yeah. when that huge uh, Operation Vittles came about. And even in something like that, uh, Montana played this huge role because the Operation Vittles had these constant aircraft flying from, from West Germany on into West Berlin to Tempelhof Airport and bringing coal and food and all kinds of supplies for two million people mm -hmm. in West Berlin. That was a huge task and it went on because the Soviets uh, saw the you know, reaction but they kept the blockade going. So it rolled into a second year and of course they needed uh, replacement pilots and air crews and they selected Great Falls Air Base as the only U.S. training base for pilots and air crews going over to relieve those guys that had been hmm. flying that uh, intensive uh, supply route into West Berlin. So that was really the beginning of a huge new mission for uh, Montana, in this case, Great Falls Air Base. And it just went from there uh, throughout the 1950s before the Air Force had a substantial radar technology and radar capability like they later got distant early warning and so on. They, they filled the gap by recruiting some 11,000 Montanans spread all around the state of Montana as part of uh, the Ground Observer Corps. They'd head out of their ranch house, look up in the air when they heard a an aircraft and they'd have identification guides, they'd try to identify, they'd call the filter center either in Billings or in Helena, 
and then the decision would be made whether to launch a, an interceptor to identify it if it hadn't been identified up to that point. If it was western Montana, they probably came out of Spokane. If it was in the rest of Montana, they came out of Great Falls Air Base. And by the middle 50s, of course, it was renamed Malmstrom Air Base for a World War II hero, Einar Malmstrom, that had uh, been killed at Great Falls in the 50s. So <clears throat> that was a huge, huge uh, operation going on all through the 50s involving at any given time, like 11,000 Montanans. So if you don't think that the, ex the Cold War extended to the home front in Montana, just think of an operation like that with that many Montanans. And of course, we had so many immigrants and sons and daughters of immigrants in Montana, a place like Black Eagle, by the, uh, ref by the Anaconda plants in Great Falls, most of their workers were from Central and Eastern Europe. So, you know, what do you think they were following all through the Cold War, the end of World War II, when their country, their home countries had been occupied by Soviet forces and the Iron Curtain was coming down. And I mean, it was hitting home to so many Montanans in that sense as well. So all these things going on, of course, uh, the first of the two proxy wars started in 1950 in Korea. We didn't fight the Soviets, but we fought their proxy war because they had given, Stalin had given the green light to the North Koreans to invade the South. And he totally miscalculated because the North Koreans promised that within three days they would have overrun the, all of the defenses in the South. Well, they almost did, and they got down to a very narrow perimeter around Busan in southern South Korea. But fortunately, we had military in Japan as an occupation force that we could get over to Busan very quickly. Leader of that force was none other than a Montana, Jay Loveless, Colonel Jay Loveless. Oh. And then another Montana came to Korea, and that was uh, Frank, he was General Frank Milburn. Frank Milburn had played uh, football with uh, Dwight Eisenhower at the academy and had been a lifelong <laughs> friend of, of Ike's, and he had risen to general status in World War II, but he took over the core that was holding the Pusan perimeter and when the uh, breakthrough came with the invasion at Incheon, uh, Milburn with his I Corps went charging north and they were so successful. And of course, even something like the Incheon landing, who did the planning for that? Well, it was the planning officer with 7th Fleet in the Western Pacific. Who was that planning officer? Well, it was Captain Ulysses Grant Sharp from Fort Benton, Montana. So, you know, you could, you can do what I did, and that is tell the history of the Cold War by the voices and activities of the Montanans that participated in it. Because wow. we were everywhere on the home front and overseas doing major jobs during the Cold War. It's an interesting premise to base the book on, and it works very well. Yeah, yeah and, and of course it just goes on from there, and of course you get to uh, the, the really uh, dangerous stage by the late 50s, early 60s, uh, when both space and intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles were coming to the forefront. Uh, we had a so-called missile gap going into the 1960 election. Mm -hmm. Didn't turn out to be because by 62, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had the first solid-fueled ICBMs, the Minuteman, that magically became operational at the very time the Cuban Missile Crisis was at its most decisive stage. Kennedy had that as his ace in the hole, even though he didn't use the term, everybody else did, because those Minuteman missiles were operational at the right time, and they did it by clusing and all sorts of uh, shortcuts that uh, accelerated their operational status. On into the space race, I mean, uh, there's, there's that exciting race to, uh, to, to man, you know, to 
to land the man on the moon. Well, before you landed the man on the moon, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Frank Borman and his crew of Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve of 1968, which had been this terrible year with tent and assassinations and the Pueblo and all these problem. And, and so the astronauts were de determined to cheer up the American people by bringing a Christmas Eve broadcast as they had their lunar circumnavigation of the moon. Frank uh, Borman, the leader of that group, and they, they read from the book of Genesis. It was a very dramatic, mm -hmm. I think probably all of, of America listened. Well, who, where should Frank Borman retire to after he left the space program and then some work he did at American Airlines? He bought a ranch near Billings and yeah. retired to Billings. So, right here. you know, it's, it, it was one of those uh, great events in space that, uh, in this case, a future Montanan was uh, the leader in. So, you know, through the 70s, of course, uh, you had cracks beginning to show in the, in the whole uh, Soviet sphere. We'd gone through Vietnam, the second proxy war, and that's a, a very important part of the book with POWs I, from Montana that I got their stories for both Korea and, and Vietnam. But uh, by the mid-70s, there were, there were serious incidents going on, like a defection of, of a young Soviet pilot across the Sea of Japan to, to, uh, J to the northern island, Hokkaido, and he landed his red-hot new secret ultra-fast MiG-25 Foxman aircraft and turned it over to the Japanese and the Americans. And he did it because he was absolutely uh, disgruntled and furious over the corruption in Soviet society, the stagnant economy, and you know the things that were beginning to bring the Soviet Union down were showing in events like that. And of course, where should uh, Viktor Belenko, that brave Soviet pilot, spend a lot of time in Montana? The mountains over by Bozeman were much like the Ural Mountains that he grew up by. He visited uh, the Montana Air Guard at Gore Field and uh, gave him a tip about uh, the glare in the cockpit on the Fox map. They defeated the glare by painting it a robin egg blue on the interior. So within a couple of weeks, the uh, new F-106s that the Air Guard had in Great Falls had robin egg blue cockpits based on Victor Belenko's tip. So, you know, there's just these amazing associations mm -hmm. each step of the way. And of course, you get to the, the really uh, concluding decade of the Cold War when the Soviet leadership, the aging group that had been there with Stalin, they were hardline, they were, none of them had been college educated. And, and one by one, they were dying off uh, Brezhnev and Cherenko and, and uh, Andropov. Uh, it was about three in three years. And the newly elected uh, President Ronald Reagan's quip was, how can I get anywhere with the Soviets? They keep dying on me. <laughs> but thank goodness they did, because it brought Mikhail Gorbachev to power in the Soviet Union. He was college educated. He was decades younger, he was 54 when he took control. And he was, he was a realist. He knew that the country was corrupt. He knew that their economy was stagnant. And he, had, he brought in these programs of Glasnost and Perestroika to make change and to open the economy. He was a communist and he was determined to keep the communist uh, program going, but at the same time solve their problems. Well, the one huge contribution Gorbachev made was the decision that no one could change his mind, but he was determined that the Soviet army would not reinvade the Warsaw Pact, East and Central European countries.
And so one by one, as, as the Polish Pope, John Paul II, took, took office, visited Poland, and had millions in the crowds that greeted him as he spread his message of, be not afraid. That led to solidarity, the workers' movement. That led to the whole population in, in Poland beginning to rise up and demand change in their government. And that, of course, was augmented by Maggie Thatcher, the Iron Lady in Britain, and of course, President Reagan. So with that cast playing together in a dramatic fashion in the mid-1980s, uh, uh, mid of course, Berlin Wall came down. And after that, within two years, the Soviet Union banned the Communist Party, dissolved itself, and reformed as Russia, but reformed without satellite, satellites in East and Central Europe, and reformed without the forcibly integrated republics that there were fit like 15 republics that had been part of the Soviet Union. They were not part of historic Russia and they all got the varying degrees of independence. So we won the Cold War. We won it in two dramatic ways. One is it never became a thermonuclear hot war. Yeah. Hugely important to all mankind, you know, on all, all sides politically, keeping it a cold war. But we also won it because our adversary, international communism and the Soviet Union dissolved. And sure, we faced threats since then, the war on terror, and now, of course, a resurgent Russia which is, seems to be actively trying to rebuild the old <laughs> enlarged so, uh, Russia, not, not a Soviet Union because they're not going back to communism. So there's that and of course uh, we could well be headed into the direction of a Cold War with, with communist China. And of course <laughs> China has not got the, quite the economic stagnation that Soviet Union had because they've allowed a certain measure of free enterprise. It isn't, it isn't like we'd like to have free enterprise because a lot of it is still state controlled. And of course the Communist Party has an iron fist on the general population. So we'll see whether we go into a, a new Cold War or not. But in the mm -hmm. meantime, that's the, kind of the capsule story of the uh, Cold War and the role that so many Montanans, which I mean, it was really everybody in Montana, whether they were in school and ducking under their desk <laughs> because that's where you'd go if there was a nuclear attack yeah. or ground observer corps or on into the military. So well, it's, it's a huge story and it's a story that I wanted to present to the younger population because it's been 30 years this year since the end of the Cold War. And how many young people even know what it was, much less how, what a life and death struggle it was. And how did we keep it from becoming a hot war? Mm -hmm. And how did we win the Cold War? So uh, I think there's a lot that young people can learn. I know those that were serving overseas and around the world with the military like I was will join me in I think having a real nostalgia trip through these <laughs> stories because these were things they participated in. They've got their own Cold War stories mm -hmm. and as I go around I'm beginning to hear some of those Cold War stories that uh, that they had, uh, you know, I, I knew they were there. I couldn't get every story from every participant because so many Montanans were involved. Well, on the one hand, of course, the, 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 thank goodness that people don't remember it because they don't remember it because it didn't turn to a hot war, as you said. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And, and if it had been a hot war, uh, it would have totally changed civilization uh, yeah. with a true nuclear or thermonuclear exchange. So. Uh, let's learn the lessons of the Cold War. Let's uh, let's keep the 
the history and the memory of the Cold War alive so that we uh, are better equipped to uh, face new threats and new situations. Well, as someone who, uh, you know, as a kid I read, uh, I read the effects of atomic bombs on, on uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think it was published in 1946, but I remember reading it. And, and uh, you know, under the desk actually did turn out to be a good place to be in a thermonuclear uh, exchange. <laughs> uh, it, it would provide more protection than you might think uh -huh. because the, the radius of destruction is so enormous for those things. Yeah. Honestly, if one of those things had gone off over Billings, we would it would have probably damaged the refinery in Laurel. That's right. It would have knocked it out. But it's just, and it was that was a small weapon compared to the, I mean, the, the hydrogen bombs that we had by the end of the, uh, new, many, by the end many, of the Cold War. Many were, times more devastating, and uh, I mean, we still have the Minuteman missile program as well as the submarine missiles, uh, our, mm -hmm. our triad, and uh, we still have threats that I think make it worth keeping that, because that's uh, that horrendous capability, probably more than anything else, kept kept a relative peace during the Cold War. Well, I, I know that Khrushchev, for instance, backed down on that. I mean, it was toe to toe, and, and I think they both finally blinked. I go through a couple. There, there are really two instances where we came right to the edge of, of a nuclear exchange, and I'll, I'll let the book speak for itself on those. We don't we don't have time in the interview to to do justice to them. But one, of course, was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The other was surprisingly in the 1980s, 1983, during Abel Archer uh, annual. Um, NATO exercise, the Able Archer 83 exercise almost turned into the real thing of World War III. And, and we in the West didn't know how close we had come until uh, one of the Soviet defectors came to the West and brought the full story. And that maybe more than any other event shocked President Reagan so much. I mean, he was, he was from the time he took office, determined to do two things, and they seemed to be contradictory, but they really weren't. One was to build up the U.S. military, and the other was to get rid of nuclear weapons, to, to bring permanent uh, peace. And if that brought the fall of the Soviet Union, all the better in his mind, because he refused to accept containment as the permanent solution. And so uh, this incident in Abel Archer 83 uh, accelerated his efforts to reach agreements with the Soviets, and I think they were pretty shaken as well by how close it had come. And. Uh, of course, it took several years, uh, and uh, Gorbachev's effectiveness beginning to, to, you know, take place in the Soviet Union to, to really bring the progress that, that set the stage that allowed the end of containment by the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the banning of the Communist Party. I mean, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Those of us that had been knee, knee deep in it all along, I think were just stunned by first the wall coming down in Berlin and then the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I, I never in my lifetime would have expected to see the reunification of Germany, for instance. Exactly. I still think oh, unbelievable. And yet it happened, and we can all rejoice it did happen, and yet let's not forget all the circumstances and how important it is to understand what on several occasions brought us so close to war and so on. And that's where I think uh, Cold War Montana can be a contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, let me back up a little bit. You're you retired from the, the Navy, of course, as a captain, and you'd spent 
most of your career or all in, in naval intelligence, is that right? My whole career, in fact, when I left the University of Montana, the reason I went into the Navy is they were the one service that would allow me to, uh, if I completed the tests and went through the pre-flight program, got my commission to be designated with an intelligence specialty from the beginning. The others offered a possibility somewhere during your career you might be able to. But the Navy, uh, it was a great uh, career in naval intelligence, uh, always challenging. Uh, and you know, when, when Navy ships, uh, I was, spent 11 years at sea, and when, when my ships were in port, a lot of the crew could semi-relax, but we in the intelligence business didn't. I mean, the, the threat was there whether we were in port or at sea. We were planning our next operations. We were keeping very, very busy. So we had a little time off, but but uh, it was a you know a 24-hour a day, seven day a week operation. Same thing on uh, shore duty. You you were always in such direct support of operations as an intelligence officer that there there was no easy, dull period. It was always, you were right on the edge of the firing line, as, as Kennedy mentioned in Great Falls when he made that great speech in 1963 after he'd stopped at Billings the next day, gave a great speech here at the fairgrounds before you had Metra, I think. Yes. <clears throat> and then went on to Great Falls and gave what I think was maybe the finest Cold War speech that he ever delivered, and of course, in less than two months, he was assassinated, and that was uh, tragic. Uh, but that was yeah. part of the uh, Cold War. Yeah. And of course, you never. I mean, you, you you had your fingers. I mean, you you are especially qualified to write this book because you always had your finger on that, and more you had you had your finger more deeply into it than than most, let's say. And I did, uh, I had a debate with myself, but uh, there are uh, boxes, uh, different places along the way where I thought I could help with my personal experiences at that time and place by telling a short narrative that kept the story of the Cold War going. I did that, and I, I'll leave it to the readers to see how it worked out. I, th I think it helped. Uh, it, it certainly in a number of different places. Uh, uh, I was, you know, at a key point or there was a key event going on that I, I had some pretty good observations from my perch. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a crow's nest you had there <laughs> to see it happening. So. Well, I'm, I'm impressed. I think it looks like a terrific book. I, uh, I wish you all the luck. So thanks for coming in. Well, thanks so much, Mark. I'm, I'm going to be uh, busy and uh, enjoying the heck out of getting around Montana with it because uh, the reaction's been really super already. People bringing me Cold War mementos and uh, sharing their stories and so on. So it's uh, it's a real trip that I think a lot of us uh, will enjoy sharing. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks again. This has been a production of This House of Books. If you'd like to be a part of the cooperative, please visit thishouseofbooks.com slash get involved.